Uh, so uh, this morning I sent you all an email message giving you the link to the uh, EDX system, okay? Uh, and it's really good practice if you do the questions on there after every lecture, if you have the time, okay? But it's entirely up to you. And uh, most of the things that I'm going to talk about are in the handout, but occasionally I will write on the board as well, so you should take some notes when I do that, okay? Okay. So I'm going to describe all of these uh, phase transformations that happen in steels. So these are what we call allotropic transitions. That means, you know, the main crystal structure of the iron changes, but it changes by a number of mechanisms which leads to a very large variety of microstructures. But these are by no means the only transformations that happen in steels. Uh, there's a literally hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of phase transformations, which means that we can control the properties very effectively depending on uh, what combination of properties we require. So by understanding the atomic mechanisms, we are able to design alloys. And you know, by the third lecture, we will be at a stage where we can actually design a, a steel. Okay? So I'm going to start today uh, with uh, martensitic transformations, which you've done before. But just, uh, just as a revision, can you, uh, can you list for me the main uh, characteristics of martensite? What do you know about martensite? And you know, treat this like brainstorming, so it doesn't matter if, it, if you get something wrong. So what are the main features of martensite? Okay, so let's uh, list some of the characteristics. Yes, uh, displacive, displacive. Yes, uh, plates or lots. So plate is shaped uh, rather like a book. So it's large in two dimensions and uh, small in the thickness direction. And a lath uh, is shaped more like a ruler. It's still thin, but one of uh, the dimensions of the habit plane is smaller than the other. Uh, there's a volume change. Um, and that connects to the displacive transformation, although we note that a volume change uh, can happen with uh, even diffusional transformations. Anything else? Yes, uh, martensite can be hard, brittle, uh, body-centered tetragonal, it's a metastable phase, phase, but you're missing one of the most important characteristics. Can anyone tell me what that is? Okay, so it is a diffusion-less transformation, isn't it? Diffusion-less transformation, so there is no composition change at all. No composition change. Uh, what that means is actually the transformation is incredibly simple. Um, you know, all we need uh, to worry about is how the crystallography determines the structure and properties. Uh, there's only a thermodynamic effect of chemical composition on the relative stability of austenite and martensite. Now, some of the items that we have listed over here are not actually correct. Uh, so, for example, martensite does not have to be hard. Uh, we'll come, come to that uh, in a minute, but in steels, uh, the hardness of martensite can vary from something like, uh, you know, 200 wickers to a thousand wickers and the reason is uh, carbon in the body-centered cubic lattice causes a tetragonal strain which interacts very strongly with the dislocation strain field whereas carbon in austenite causes just an isotropic expansion and therefore there is a weak interaction with uh, dislocation strain field so carbon doesn't harden austenite as much as it hardens uh, martensite uh, and without carbon, it need not be hard and it need not be brittle. In fact, mar-aging steels uh, contain very little carbon and they are extremely tough. They're not at all brittle. It's 
it's the hardness which makes martensite brittle. So maraging steels are made uh, into a fully martensitic structure by quenching. Uh, it's a soft martensite, so you can form it into shape. And then you harden it by precipitation hardening with intermetallic compounds uh, tempering at something like 550 degrees centigrade. Uh, similarly, martensite doesn't have to be body-centered tetragonal, it can be body-centered cubic. It can even be face-centered cubic in, in another system uh, than steels, and, and so on. Okay, we'll go into this in more detail shortly. So, this is a, a conservative list of the different materials in which martensite happens. Uh, there's a huge number of additional materials. For example, there are polymers where you can get martensitic transformation. But plutonium is an interesting example because uh, the solid that forms from the liquid is actually less dense than the liquid, you know, like ice and water. So it undergoes a whole series of martensitic transformation in an effort to densify. Uh, these transformations happen at a relatively low temperature because the melting point of plutonium is around 500 degrees centigrade. Okay. And the crystal structures are quite complicated. Uh, uranium has lots of martensitic transformations. Ceramics, I think you've done this before, that uh, you, know, you toughen ceramics with martensitic transformation, right? Zirconia has uh, martensitic transformations. And uh, steels. Uh, Copper aluminum alloys is another form of shape memory uh, metals and even solid solutions of gas, okay, argon, nitrogen, solid solutions will undergo martensitic transformation. Now, uh, we said martensite is hard, uh, but look, uh, over here we have a hardness uh, in uh, steel from 300 to 600 vickers and we can even go lower in hardness. So what is it that causes uh, martensite to be hard? Zirconia, it's straightforward. You know, it's a, it's a ceramic, so the bonding is very directional, and it's not a metallic bond, so you can't displace atoms without breaking bonds, okay? But what is it that causes uh, martensite to be hard in steel? I can get you really soft martensite in iron alloys, okay? Carbon. Uh, so, why does carbon cause such intense hardening? Increases the volume change and therefore increases the strain to introduce into the surrounding matrix. Right. So, the volume change uh, alone doesn't do much because, you know, dislocations interact with shear strains, don't they? They are mostly about shear. They hardly interact with hydrostatic uh, strains. And that's why substitutional atoms don't harden much. So there's something special, which I think you've done before. Place it in anisotropic interstices in the Exactly. Uh, so if you look at the uh, BCC structure, So we've got atoms at the corners and an atom in the middle, and this is your octahedral interstice. The distance here is A, but the distance uh, along the uh, face diagonal is root 2A. Okay, so it's an irregular octahedron. In other words, uh, it's shorter along one of its axes than along the other two axes. So when you place a carbon atom in there, it causes an anisotropic uh, strain which has a massive interaction with dislocations. If you look at austenite, on the other hand, uh, the octahedral interstice in austenite is actually isotropic. Okay. So, we have these face centering atoms here, and the octahedron that you get is actually has the same axis in all three directions, A, A, A. So you only get a volume change. So when you add carbon to austenite, it doesn't harden anywhere near as much as carbon hardens the body-centered cubic lattice. So martensite itself is not hard. I can get martensite in absolutely pure iron, 
uh, it, I simply have to cool sufficiently rapidly so that uh, you know, all near neighboring atoms remain the same, and I get martensitic transformation, and it's soft. And uh, there's another class of uh, iron alloys called maraging steels, uh, which have almost zero carbon. So when you quench them, they will form martensite, which is really quite soft. Okay? So you can form it into various shapes, and then you uh, age harden it with intermetallic compounds by tempering at around 500 degrees centigrade, and then it becomes hard. But without carbon, martensite isn't hard. Of course, you know, the fine plates and so on add to strength, but not as much as carbon does. It follows, therefore, that it's not brittle. It's not intrinsically brittle unless you make it extremely hard, right? Okay. So it can happen, uh, martensitic transformation can occur in many different materials. Uh, it's of the greatest uh, technological importance in iron alloys because of the strengthening that we get from it. And of course, we can control the toughness as well by tempering or by uh, a variety of uh, alloying additions, which we'll go into at some stage. Uh, this is an interesting example uh, of a, a virus, effectively. So, you know, there's a head and there are some arms to this virus. And the way that it works is it goes onto the surface of a, a bacterium here, and then this needle here compresses, pierces the bacterium and it infects the bacterium with its uh, DNA and therefore it multiplies. And the way this works is you have a cylindrical crystal which undergoes martensitic transformation. So goes from long thin to short fat and that's what operates the hypodermic needle. Uh, and uh, these are actual optical micrographs of uh, the virus doing its business. Now, what this illustrates uh, is something that we missed out, uh, at least we didn't explicitly state as a key characteristic of martensitic transformation, that when martensite forms, there will be a deformation. Okay? It's, it's, it's like slip or twinning. Slip and twinning cause a deformation. Martensite also is a physical deformation which you can observe, except that the crystal structure is changed at the same time, whereas slip and twinning do not change the crystal structure. So it's, a, it's actually a physical deformation. And you can see that in this uh, movie, this is a, a shape memory element. And you know it's flat when it's cold, and you put it onto a hot plate, and it changes its shape. There are no connections in that piece of metal. It's just a solid piece of metal, and yet it has changed its shape uh, completely. And when you cool it again, it'll recover its original shape. So you get a deformation when it transforms, and you reverse the deformation when it untransforms into the parent. Uh, in this case, it's uh, uh, a little bit more complicated. Uh, but you can see that you can reverse the shape deformation. So, although the movements, relative movements of atoms during martensitic transformation are very small because there's no diffusion, you add up those motions and you will get a large deformation. Okay, um, how do we know that this is a diffusionless transformation. What is the ex what are the kinds of experiments you can do or which you have which prove that it's a diffusionless transformation? So you've seen many of the techniques uh, that we have in the department. So what kind of experiments can you do to prove that martensitic transformation is diffusionless? Sorry. Yes. Uh, Give, give me an idea how speed of, sound. speed of sound in the metal, which would be of the order of? Uh, yeah, uh, let's say 5,000 meters per second, okay? And um, I don't know if I've shown you this before, but um, when you have transformations happening in thousands of meters per second, uh, and then 
they, you know, as a plate of martensite forms and then it stops, there's some energy dissipated, okay, like a, like a momentum being dissipated. And that produces acoustic emissions from the steel. So you can actually hear that's martensite forming. Can you hear it? Yeah. So if you have an Android phone, you can put this on to your phone and listen to it and tell your friends about acoustic emissions coming out from steel. So uh, what else? What else? The, the fastest um, solidification reaction is 80 meters per second. Martensite can form at thousands of meters per second inside uh, steel. Yes, uh, you can do microanalysis, right? Uh, uh, so you basically put an electron beam on your sample, you get x-rays from it, and you analyze the x-rays for chemical information. What would be the resolution of that technique, roughly? Uh, that's the, yeah, you're right, the chemical resolution. And we, we can improve that by dwelling over there for a long time. Yeah. But what about the spatial resolution? Yeah, so, microns. yeah. So the problem is that, you know, even though your electron beam will be very narrow, it actually spreads inside your sample. So you're picking up information from a significant uh, region of your sample. So if you have small variations in composition at the interface, you may not resolve them, okay? So is there any other technique that you know of which does atomic resolution chemical analysis? Uh, TEM is uh, very good because, you know, you can have a 40 angstrom thin specimen and do EDX. Uh, so you can't spread more than 40 angstroms, okay? Um, have you heard of the atom probe? You know, where you take, uh, make a sharp needle, put a very large electrical field, and you can actually pull out atoms and do time of flight mass spectroscopy to identify them. So, using all those techniques, you can prove that there isn't any diffusion even on the finest conceivable scale. So, um, one more aspect uh, you saw that in argon nitrogen solid solutions, you know, you get martensitic transformation at 40 Kelvin, you can even produce it at 4 Kelvin, which means that, you know, it's not reasonable to assume that there is any diffusion during martensitic transformation, okay? So all of these things uh, together tell us that it is truly a diffusionless transformation, and the only consequence of adding alloying elements is to change the relative free energies of the parent and the product phases you need not worry at all about diffusion during the transformation. And that's why I said, you know, it's a very simple transformation. So, so uh, feel free to ask any questions during the lecture, okay? Okay, uh, so you said that the shape of martensite is in the form of plates. So a plate would be, um, you know, something uh, like a book. It's uh, got a large plane and thin in one direction. And a lath would be something like a, a ruler. Yeah, so it's thin, but there's another short dimension which is bigger and it's long, okay? Now, how do I know by looking at this micrograph whether martensite, martensite is plate-shaped? Because remember, this is a two-dimensional section, okay? But can I conclude from this micrograph that martensite plates are plates? So, unfortunately, in many books and publications, people talk about martensite needles, right? So that would be a needle. Now, if I section this, the most probable section is not going to be uh, the sort of image that you see on the board. It'll be circular or slightly elliptical. It's very rare that you would actually section in the plane of the needle, okay? So, there are no sections there which look circular or elliptical. So, these are truly plates in three dimensions. 
you can actually make a metallographic observation on two separate surfaces like this okay so you polish two surfaces with a sharp edge in between and you can see that it's a plate in three dimensions or you can do serial sectioning okay that means you polish a little bit away look at the image again and so on okay so um, when martensite forms inside your material and there are it's a polycrystalline material so it's surrounded by many other crystals um, it is constrained by all those surroundings yeah you know this is a transformation that's happening inside the steel and you've seen that it's accompanied by deformations so it will form as a thin plate because a thin plate will show later minimizes the elastic strain energy of the surroundings but uh, supposing that you have a single crystal right and it's just surrounded by air then you will get martensitic transformation but it won't be in the form of a thin plate because the strain energy uh, you know is basically zero you're pushing against air right so this is called an unconstrained transformation and you can see a single interface moving to create that region of martensite but it won't be in the form of a plate and if I have a wire like this and I cool it extremely rapidly to get martensite then it will tilt like this but it won't appear at all like a plate so the plate shape is purely to minimize the elastic strain energy and this interface plane here is called the habit plane right the, that's the plane on which the martensite forms and the average plane of this lenticular plate lenticular means lens like with a sharp tip the average plane of that lenticular plate is the same as in an unconstrained transformation so there's some crystallography there which determines the plane on which the martensite forms okay right unfortunately that plane is really quite complicated you know uh, so notice that in this table I have put approximate habit plane indices because the actual planes on which martensite forms uh, is irrational so for example 315 10 and very strange indices for the habit plane uh, and you know we did this in in C6 but I'm just going to go over it again uh, that these are irrational planes and it doesn't make sense because things like slip and twinning happen on rational planes okay so we need to address some uh, anomalies with the crystallo crystallography of martensite similarly if you look at the orientation relationship between the parent and product you'll find that the close back plane of the austenite is roughly parallel to the most closely packed plane in the martensite so a 111 plane of austenite would be slight uh, would be approximately parallel to a 110 type plane of the martensite but not exactly so right and the close back directions within those planes would be approximately parallel but not exactly so the orientation relationship itself is irrational okay um, so these are just uh, the way in which orientation relationships are expressed that you have a plane parallel to another plane in the product and similarly you have a, a direction within that plane parallel to a direction within the um, product but bear in mind these are approximations the real orientation relationship is irrational now we often say that martensitic transformation is athermal right uh, any ideas what that means yeah. so you know if you look at that time temperature transformation diagram and if I'm producing uh, perlite so I supercool the austenite to this temperature and I hold it there okay then over a period of time I will get more and more perlite right uh, and similarly if I have uh, bainite here I hold it there I will get more and more bainite during isothermal transformation 
But it's quite different here for martensitic transmission that if I cool, I get 1% of martensite there, and if I hold it, it remains at 1%. Okay? I, in order to get more transmission, I have to supercool further. And if you look at that equation, which, uh, which is just there for illustration purposes, I'm not going to derive it, it tells you that the volume fraction of martensite is only a function of the temperature below the martensite start temperature. There's no time involved in that. Okay. And the reason uh, why this happens is as follows. So martensite, which I label as alpha prime, is said to be a thermal. Okay. Um, and essentially what this means is that the volume fraction uh, of martensite is a function only of the undercooling below the MS temperature. Undercooling below the MS temperature, that is MS minus T. There is apparently no time dependence. So apparently no time dependence. Now this is uh, actually a little bit of an illusion because we said that martensite grows extremely rapidly or it can grow extremely rapidly. Uh, so because it forms rapidly, because alpha prime can form rapidly, uh, we do not pick up the time dependence. We do not pick up time dependence. But if we made a high-speed movie, we would actually see the volume fraction of martensite increasing as a function of time. Uh, nevertheless, uh, even if we did that, we would see that it reaches a limiting value. Uh, you know, for example, 5%. And then we would have to undercool it further to get it to 10%. And that dependence on uh, the, the limiting volume fraction volume fraction at any temperature is determined by the exhaustion of EZ nuclei. Once those nuclei are exhausted, you have to cool further, supercool, in order to trigger more difficult nuclei. So once exhausted, the material must be undercooled further, must be undercooled further, in order to trigger the more difficult nuclei. And this is why uh, we reach a limiting volume fraction at any particular temperature. And these are experiments which were, whoops, yeah, these are experiments which were first done in uh, Russia, uh, which showed that if I go to a low enough temperature, so even when martensite is happening very rapidly, if I go to a low enough temperature, then the reaction will slow down because you know even the interface requires some activation energy to move, and therefore you can pick up a classical C curve for martensitic transformation. Okay, uh, so this is for zero percent uh, transformation, and then as a function of time, you can see the martensite evolving. Uh, 
if I cool the martensite sufficiently rapidly, then I can avoid transformation altogether. Yeah? Just like in an ordinary TTT curve. And then when I warm it up, it will form martensite. Okay? So there is thermal activation involved in the movement of the interface, but the activation barrier is so small that you actually pick it up at a very low temperature. Okay? Is everyone happy with that? Excellent. Now, um, I've already talked about the interface and the fact that there is a barrier to the movement of the interface. And uh, just to revise a little bit, if I looked at the interface, what would I see in a transmission electron microscope? Yeah. When you observe an interface in a transmission electron microscope, what do you expect to see? So an interface between two crystals. Dislocations, yeah? And uh, we, can, we can demonstrate that by creating an interface. So here we have a single crystal drawn in a continuous line. If I slice it and I tilt one half with respect to the other, then I've created a bicrystal, but I'm left with uh, this gap over here, which doesn't really exist when we have a grain boundary, right? So if you think about a dislocation, if I shove in an extra half plane, then you're tilting the two sides of the crystal by a certain angle. So you can describe the structure of an interface in terms of this array of dislocations, which are all these extra half planes that you shove in to produce a tilt about the axis pointing normal to the plane of the board. So the structure of the interface is described in terms of an array of dislocations. Okay? Uh, we've done this before, this is just a revision. And these are uh, dislocations in the sense that you know, they have a Burgers vector, they have a line vector. In this case, the line vector is poking into the plane of the board. And in a transmission electron microscope, by doing contrast experiments, uh, we can uh, work out what the Burgers vector is. Okay? Okay, so um, we now need to distinguish between two kinds of interfaces. The first one is what we call a glissile interface. So just as a dislocation can slip, right, without requiring any diffusion, in a glissile interface, the Burgers vector is pointing out of the plane of the interface. So if you apply a stress, and the stress can be in the form of an undercooling, giving you a chemical driving force, yeah? then those dislocations can glide without uh, requiring any diffusion. Okay? And you can see that if they glide, then that will also produce a change in shape because this side of the crystal will grow at the expense of this side if the interface is moving in this direction. Okay? So here you would continue to grow this crystal along this direction and this one would shrink. On the other hand, the sessile interface, uh, where the Burgers vectors lie in the plane of the interface, uh, you would have to have climb in order for that interface to move because you know, you've know you either got to add to the extra half planes here or remove, you know, uh, remove atoms, uh, uh, rows of atoms in order for this to translate. Okay? So this, the motion of that interface would absolutely necessitate diffusion. Okay. So you cannot have that kind of an interface existing in martensitic transformations. That would require diffusion. And the condition, therefore, is that for martensitic transformations, you must have a glissile interface, okay. one which can move without any diffusion at all. And of course, a glissile interface is also consistent with a shape change, because just like slip produces a change in shape, we would expect the array of dislocations to produce a shape change, which is characteristic of martensitic transformation. But there is a further caveat that, you know, if there's more than one array of dislocations inside our interface, then they are likely to interfere 
and produce sessile components. So on this board I have just uh, two dislocations. Uh, here we have an edge dislocation, Burgers vector is at an angle to the line vector and here we have a screw dislocation where the Burgers vector is parallel to the line vector. When they cross this will acquire a step parallel to B2 and this will acquire a step parallel to B1. Okay? So here we have seen the screw dislocation acquire an edge component because, whoops, because uh, B2 does not change along the line but this step has been produced by the motion of B1 and similarly B1 will acquire a step parallel to B2. So the, if this screw dislocation was glissal because it can glide on any plane containing its line vector, yeah, it is no longer the case because that jog, uh, that step on that line now is an edge component. Right? So it is restricted in how it can move. An edge dislocation can only move on the plane containing its line vector and Burgers vector. Yeah? So the second condition for a modern static interface is that you must only have a single array of dislocations in the interface. Okay? Is everyone happy with that? Right. Uh, so, uh, a glissal interface cannot contain more than one set of dislocations and Martin Cedric transformation is only possible if the deformation which takes the parent into the product phase leaves one line completely invariant, coherent, right? That means undistorted and unrotated because if, if that line is not coherent you will require another set of dislocations to accommodate the misfit along that line, okay? So the fundamental condition for Martin Cedric <coughs> transformation is that the deformation which takes the parent into the product will leave one line completely coherent between the parent and product phases. If you cannot find that line, Martin Cedric transformation is impossible. So that is the general condition for any material to be able to transform into Martin side that you must be able to find one line which is invariant. Because otherwise, you know, if I am looking at the interface plane, uh, if I have misfit along the line vector of these dislocations, I will need another set of dislocations to accommodate that misfit which builds up over distance. Yeah. So this is really uh, quite a powerful result. Uh, if somebody asks you, you know, will I get Martin Cedric transformation in this material? and you look at the crystallography of the parent and the product and whatever rotations etc you do you cannot find a coherent line between the two lattices then it is impossible to get Martin Cedric transformation. Okay. Everyone happy with that? <coughs> so just by simple arguments about the lack of diffusion during Martin Cedric transformation and therefore the structure of the interface you can predict whether the transformation is possible or not possible. Now obviously if you have this level of coherency in the interface then the interfacial energy is going to be quite small and typically it is of the order of uh, 0.2 joules per meter squared which compares with a twin boundary uh, which is fully coherent. You know you have got perfect matching between the parent and product when you twin something at the interface. right? So uh, compare with an incoherent boundary and you know the surface energy of window glass is consistent that the interfacial energy between martensite and austenite is really quite small. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's let's look at the the shape deformation a bit more. So. Imagine that we have a, a square pattern of atoms, all right? And I want to change the crystal structure, and crystal structure is defined by the pattern of atoms. So I can change that crystal structure without breaking any of the bonds. Okay. So look, uh, now we have a different pattern in which the atoms are arranged, and you have seen that none of the bonds have been broken, okay? So the atoms have moved, but they have moved without breaking any bonds. 
but the consequence is that you know the change in the shape of the pattern will also be reflected in the external shape of the crystal you can see that it's changed dramatically okay um, and if I show you um, a real movie so this was taken by a colleague of mine at um, the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign and we are looking at an iron platinum alloy and I don't know if you've started the movie or not yeah so you can see uh, martensite plates forming okay. and those are physical deformations happening because of the way in which the pattern in which the atoms are arranged change so these are all plates of martensite forming Now this particular alloy, iron platinum alloy, uh, is a shape memory material. Okay? So when we heat this up again to go back to the parent phase, you'll see that this deformation disappears. Which is really actually quite remarkable, right? the whole specimen will become completely flat again. Can you see some of the plates are now disappearing? And the fact that you can see this transformation happening means that it's not very fast. Okay, you can see the plates evolving in volume or disappearing in volume means it's not very fast and you know that confirms the fact that it's not really an thermal transformation but when it happens fast uh, we need the time resolution to observe. So the shape change that we see is uh, real and it's a very large deformation Now, it is, however, special, all right, in the sense that uh, when we make measurements of that shape change with a high accuracy, could you, um, do you know how we might make such measurements? How can we measure surface topography? Yeah. Very good. So, atomic force microscope, uh, ba basically, you know, there's a needle which keeps an incredibly small distance away from the surface. So it has feedback from the tunneling current and then it moves and you work out the topography. Right? So you can accurately measure that or you can use optical interference microscopy if your, if your um, sample is not uh, very fine, if your material is not very fine. You know, just like you get those Newton's rings when you put a curved glass onto a flat glass, right? you can measure accurately the surface topography using interference <coughs> methods. When we do that, we find that the plane on which the martensite forms appears to be completely undistorted and unrotated. Right? And the way I can describe that is as follows. Supposing that I have a crystal with a Poisson's ratio which is zero. Okay? Then when I pull it, uh, I will get a volume change which is normal to the horizontal plane, right? And beryllium is a metal which has a Poisson's ratio that's almost zero. Okay. Uh, shear you are familiar with; it leaves the plane on which the shear happens completely coherent. If I add those two up, then that is the measured shape strain of martensitic transformation. There is a shear that's parallel to the habit plane and a volume change that's normal to the habit plane. If it was an isotropic volume change, then that plane would be distorted, right? Okay. And the magnitudes of the shear and dilatation are 0 0.26 and 0 0.03 approximately, uh, reproducible though, okay? Uh, so can you give me uh, a typical elastic strain when I 
put a stress of 200 megapascals on steel. Yeah, to 10 to the minus 3. So these are massive, you know, 0 0.26 and 0 0.03. So uh, these, these transformations will be dominated by strain energy. Okay? Um, it is such a large strain energy that features like interfacial energy minimization and so on really don't play a big role except at the nucleation stage. I'll give you some numbers uh, later on. And that is the reason why martensite forms as a thin plate. So supposing that um, I plot a stress versus strain curve. Okay, so this is uh, shear strain and this is shear stress. And I'm looking at the elastic re regime then what's the strain energy per unit volume? Yeah, uh, it's the area under, under this uh, curve per unit volume is equal to half tor times gamma and I can replace uh, the stress by the modulus times the strain, can't I, because of Hooke's law, stress proportional to strain. So I can write that as half half mu into gamma squared, where mu is the shear modulus. Now, when we measure the strain, uh, we are not actually picking up um, very, very small atomic steps unless we look extremely carefully. And we noted that the interface consists of dislocations, and it's a movement of those dislocations which produces the shape change. So, a single dislocation would produce a single step, but we have an array of dislocations, so they produce a series of steps which macroscopically looks uh, like a uniform deformation here. Okay? And if you look at this, uh, you have the elastic strain energy per unit volume at the top and you have the shear modulus here as we did on the sketch. Uh, you have the shear strain and dilatational strain squared as we did on our board. But you have this additional term here which is the thickness over the length of the plate. And to derive that term is very difficult. Uh, you use uh, something called Ashelby's theory, which we haven't covered. But I want to show you roughly why the strain energy depends on the thickness to the length ratio of the plate. OK. so. Um, if this is my austenite and it transforms into martensite, then this is the shape deformation that we observe. This is alpha prime and gamma. And these arrows give you the displacement as opposed to the strain. The strain is simply the displacement divided by the height. Okay? So the strain is the same everywhere, but the displacement gets larger and larger as we move away from the habit plane. Yeah. So if I make my plate thin, and bear in mind that this is surrounded by rigid material on all sides, if I make my plate thin and very sharp, then at the tip of the plate, the displacement is very small. The strain is the same, but the displacement is very small. So it's pushing against its surroundings, and therefore you get a reduction in strain energy. Right? By making the plate thin, you get a reduction in strain energy because the magnitudes of the displacements are minimized. Okay. If I have a fat plate, then imagine pushing this large arrow against all the surroundings. Okay? 
So that's the reason why martensite is in the form of a thin plate. And similarly, if you look at mechanical twins, you know, mechanical twins are deformations like martensite, except you don't change the crystal structure. They form as extremely fine lenticular plates, right? Whereas annealing twins are more like blocks where, you know, there's no deformation involved, but you're simply minimizing interfacial energy, okay? You've seen annealing twins, right? And noted the difference from mechanical twins. Okay, so I think we've reached uh, five minutes. So I'll stop now and carry on in the next lecture.